Hi guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel if you are new here. My name is Vanessa and in today's video I'm going to be doing kind of like a weird girl lit reading vlog. I have a couple of different, well I have more than a couple of different books that I want to read in this vlog and I am very excited to read all of them. A couple of these recommendations I got from a end cap at Barnes & Noble. If I can find the footage, I will <laughs> insert it here. But there was basically a end cap that had literally the sign said like weird girl literature or something like that. And I was like, well, thank you. Thank you for catering to what I was looking for. So a couple of those books that were on that end cap were Earth Eater. This is by Dolores Reyes, and I believe this is a translated work. I also have Pizza Girl. This is by Jean Kyung Frazier. Um, my friend Brie <laughs> really sold me on this book because of, I think it was like the second, yeah, the second page at the top says, I thank God that Daryl's boyfriend fucked a Walgreens checkout girl. Yep. All right. We also saw Patricia Wants to Cuddle, but I didn't purchase the book for this one. So I have the audio through Hoopla. Another book I would like to read in this vlog came from Sarah over at Wicked Reading. And she had talked about this book, Earthlings. This is by Sayaka Murata. I have had this on my TBR before, but she talked about this in one of her vlogs. And I was like, ooh, that sounds kind of interesting. So I picked it up for myself. And then I've had these last couple of books on my shelves for quite some time. So I am unsure if they will fit perfectly with this theme for the weird girl literature, but we're gonna see. So we have The Virgin Suicides. This is by Jeffrey Eugenides, if I'm saying that correctly. And I just, this cover, I love so much. And the book that I'm actually gonna start reading first is My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfe. I'm gonna read the synopsis for each book as I actually start reading them. So this one says it is the shocking and strangely tender story of a young woman's efforts to duck the ills of the world with the help of one of the worst psychiatrists in the annals of literature. Um, so I do know that this has some sort of mental health representation to it and um, it'll be interesting to get like my perspective on it. That sounds very narcissistic but I am interested in sharing my perspective on it, given that I'm in the mental health field. Um, but it says, our narrator should be happy, shouldn't she? She's young, thin, pretty, a recent Columbia graduate, works an easy job at a hip art gallery, lives in an apartment on the Upper East Side of Manhattan paid for, like the rest of her needs, by her inheritance. But there is a hole in her heart, and it isn't just the loss of her parents, or the way her Wall Street boyfriend treats her, or her sadomasochistic relationship with her best friend Riva. It's the year 2000 in a city of glitter with wealth and possibility. What could be so terribly wrong? I think from what I've heard, this book is literally a girl takes a year to rest and relax from her life. I don't necessarily know how tough her life is. It sounds not tough if her inheritance is paying for all of her needs. Yeah, I'm interested to see what this book is about, so let's get right into it.
next day. Sorry if you can hear the washer dryer in the background. It's laundry day. So I am about 40% into my year of rest and relaxation and I'm like trying to figure out how I feel. So basically we have this main character. I forget her name. Do they even say her name? I don't know if they ever said her name. But we have this main character who decides that she's just going to take a year off to <laughs> rest and relax, right? Like just as the title suggests. And she's kind of a shitty character, like very unlikable. Her best friend Reva is also very unlikable, but less unlikable than our narrator who I don't know their name. But it sounds like her best friend Reva is just trying to like help her get out of this depression, this funk, whatever is going on for the main character. But the main character's like, nah, I'd just rather sleep. Like things happen where um, Reva is like, hey, it's my birthday, or my mom died. And the main character is kind of like ignoring her phone calls, or just like, nah, I don't want to come out. I'm just gonna sleep instead. So her friend is obviously concerned, like, what are these pills they have you on? You know, I've heard things like getting out for walks and not sleeping as much, like, like you're sleeping too much. Like those things will help you probably function a little better, which are true. Um, then we also have a third character um, that we see the main character interacting with, which is the psychiatrist, Dr. Tuttle. And Dr. Tuttle kind of seems like a very, I don't, inexperienced isn't the right word, but very just kind of apathetic psychiatrist. She's just kind of like, let me throw drugs at every problem that you have. And very much so takes this girl's responses at face value, like doesn't investigate anything, doesn't say, hey, you know, this is kind of odd, like maybe we should look into doing some blood work or maybe we should um, kind of touch base a little bit more because that's the other thing too is the psychiatrist is like, say that I, I meet with you weekly um, even though we don't, like that's kind of fraudulent. Um, so the psychiatrist isn't really doing their job. They just kind of are throwing more pills at this girl's situation which doesn't seem to be making it better. And the girl doesn't really care. She's just like, I just want to sleep. Like, just let me keep sleeping. So um, we also have one more character, um, a, a boyfriend, a past boyfriend. Um, I forget his name. Tyler? That doesn't sound right. Liam? I don't know. I forget his name. He's pretty shitty. <laughs> I'm like, what's his name? Trevor. It was Trevor. Okay, so Trevor seems like a very uh red flag like red flag is a great word for him he is pretty much just like treating this main female character as like like i just want you for your body like i don't really want you and he's not very clear in saying that and the main character believes that she loves him he's like whoa like no that's not not what i'm here for um but kind of like you know things will happen where he'll want her to perform sexual acts on him and he doesn't reciprocate and she's always like oh he doesn't know how to do it but like it's okay I still love him and I'm like girl what is wrong with you and like yes I was there at one point in my life too where I was just like young dumb wanted the attention of a man an older man an attractive man whatever and maybe didn't necessarily see these red flags but I'm kind of like you're not helping yourself. <laughs> like, what is going on? And it's frust it's like really frustrating to read because like I can understand. Like she's probably very depressed. Um, but also or and also there's like her lifestyle is just has kind of led her to where she's at now. Like she there was some stuff about her family history and how her parents really sounded like they had a very dysfunctional relationship. And she even said in, at one point, like, her mom loved sleeping. Her mom also had some other, probably mental health stuff going on, too. 
her mom was using some sort of drugs. I don't know if they were like like drug drugs or like medication kinds of drugs. Maybe it was a little bit of both. But um, it doesn't sound like the mom was a really good example because the mom would be like, oh, I love sleeping. And the main character would sleep with her mom in bed just like that's maybe like how they would bond in a way, which it's kind of a weird way to bond with your mom. And then dad would like sleep on the couch and she made this comment of like my dad, he's the one who's working really hard and my mom's lazy, but like how can we get this king size bed, you know? The main female character is very, very unlikable. I'm not necessarily enjoying the story, but I'm not hating it either. And here's where I'm a little conflicted because I don't know how to rate a book and I'm, I'm not even done yet. But like when, as I'm thinking about formulating my, my rating, I start thinking about like, okay, where does this book kind of land for me? You know, am I still vibing with it? And I am still vibing with it. Like, I'm very curious to see where the rest of the story goes. But like, when you have these very unlikable characters and the plot, the story is not bad. Like, like I said, I'm enjoying the writing. I'm enjoying the, I'm like maybe intrigued. I'm intrigued to continue and see what happens next. I just don't know how you land on a rating, you know? But yeah, I'm gonna keep going. I only have a couple more hours left on the audiobook for this. I'm kind of like reading along a little bit as I listen and then sometimes I'll get up and go do laundry or what, like the laundry just ended. But yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of here to see where it goes. Y'all, I just finished this book. And I'm kind of like, what the heck did I just read? Because. <laughs> The ending. I I feel like it was, I didn't even think about it, but I feel like, okay, that makes sense of like where it's going. I stand by everything I said before in my last update about how, you know, the main character is incredibly unlikable and very privileged. And I think she does acknowledge that she can essentially take a year to rest and relax and not have to work and pay bills because she's got this inheritance. But, you know, Riva, I feel like a lot of people just like looking at reviews and things like that, people were like, Reva was also unlikable. And I was like, you know, she really wasn't that bad. Like obviously the main character was just atrocious. But Reva was kind of like, she was who she was. But I think a lot of times she really cared for the main character, the narrator. And you know, you could really see that come out in a lot of their interactions with each other. But the main character just like couldn't get herself out of this depression, like no matter what kind of mental health issue that you might have, like nobody is going to drag you out of your depression or your anxiety. Like you have to put in the work to do those things. And I feel like the main character kind of just like, not gave up, but just kind of didn't really try. <laughs> like just had no motivation or desire to just put forth that effort and Reva was like out there living her life and maybe there was some sort of resentment from the main character with Reva. I don't know. But yeah, the ending was a little kind of left up to interpretation. I guess it kind of would have been interesting to see like if that person was Reva that she was describing in the very last chapter slash one page. If, I don't know, I guess it would be nice to have a little bit of story on that. And if she grows from that circumstance, that particular event that she witnessed, or what? <laughs> but this was interesting. Um, I didn't hate it, didn't love it. I'm probably gonna just settle on like a three star. And it just wasn't anything special to me, but I'm glad I read it. Like I, I got to finally see what all the hype was about and didn't really feel like it was worth the hype, but that's a-okay. <laughs> so the next book that I think I'm going to read or really listen to is Patricia Wants to Cuddle. And I know nothing about this book. Patricia Wants to Cuddle looks like a horror LGBTQ romance, possibly. Okay, we have the contestants of a reality television dating show compete for love and their lives in this pulse-pounding and viciously funny fiction debut from the GLAAD award-winning author of Real Queer America. So this is by Samantha Allen. 
So it says, win the final four women in a competition for an aloof, if somewhat sleazy, bachelor's heart arrive on a mysterious island in the Pacific Northwest. They mentally prepare themselves for another week of extreme sleep deprivation, invasive interviews, and of course, the salacious drama that viewers nationwide tune in to eagerly devour. Each woman came on the catch for their own reasons brand sponsorships, followers, and yes, even love. And they've all got their eyes steadfastly trained on their respective prizes. Enter Patricia, a temperamental but woefully misunderstood local living alone in the dark, verdant woods, and desperate to forge a connection of her own. As the contestants perform for the cameras that surround them, Patricia watches from her place in the shadows, a queer specter haunting the bombastic display of heterosexuality before her. But when the cast and crew at last make her acquaintance atop the island's largest and most desolate peak, they soon realize that if they're to have any hope of making it to the next elimination event, they'll first have to survive the night. I don't necessarily know if this quite fits in with the weird girl lip but it was on that little end cap at barnes and nobles so we're gonna go with it <laughs> so here we go percent through Patricia wants to cuddle and I don't know who Patricia is <laughs> I am hanging out on Neva's sprints at the moment and um, we were just chatting so I'll show you here so we're over here just chatting about don't really know who Patricia is and kind of dawned on me that um, in the synopsis on Goodreads it says um, Patricia Wants to Cuddle is also a love story between star-crossed lesbians who rise above their intolerant town, a deeply ambivalent woman and her budding self-actualization, and a chosen family of misfit islanders forging community against all odds. So I feel like in the last 31% I'm supposed to find out something that I don't know yet, obviously, but... Um, I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to find out who Patricia is, but I'm kind of like looking at the cover and there's a, what looks to be like a Bigfoot hand or maybe like a gorilla hand. I don't really know what it is. I'm assuming it's Bigfoot, but it's nails are painted red. And if it's a lesbian star crossed lover story, I'm wondering if Patricia might be the Bigfoot hand, might be the Bigfoot. I don't know. <laughs> But I'm not sure who the girl taking the selfie is. Um, but anyways, what I know about this story so far is it is with four contestants on a reality television show. So we have Vanessa, who is, I think, kind of like in the lead for the reality show. Like, it's kind of like The Bachelor. So they're all trying to gain the attention of Jeremy. Um, actually, they're not all trying to gain the attention of Jeremy because some of them are there for other reasons. So Vanessa is there because I think she not only wants, well, she's there because she does want to get with Jeremy, but then has plans to, I think it's her, end up like splitting after about a month because she wants like the brand deals and stuff that come with being a reality television star. Then you have Lila May, who is this like super religious girl, I think, trying to promote religious content and spread the word about God. You have Renee, who I think is a black woman who doesn't care <laughs> about Jeremy, to be honest. Um, I think she's there because she just wants like the experience or the vacation or whatever, but I think she actually said she's lesbian, so she's kind of like, I don't care. And the last person, I cannot remember her name. I think the last girl's name is Amanda, but I honestly don't remember anything about her. Oh, okay. So I'm looking at a website. So we have Christian pageant queen and influencer Lila May, fashion blogger Amanda, model slash vixen Vanessa, and quiet brainy Renee. 
So they're all part of this reality television show called The Catch, which is essentially The Bachelor. They're trying to, um, they're the four finalists that are trying to get with Jeremy. I'm listening to this book, so it's kind of hard because I think there's also some blogs and um, chat conversations and stuff that I'm not visually seeing, which kind of hurt my experience a little bit. My library didn't have this book in ebook form or physical book form, so I'm only listening to it on audio. And each of the chapters is told in the perspective of one of the characters, one of the, the female characters so far. We haven't got any of the male perspectives, but we do have these like posts from the 70s like 1972 and there's something that happened back in the day because I think this reality show happens in more modern day like 2000 something but yeah I still don't know who Patricia is so I'm gonna keep reading and see if I can figure out who Patricia is I forgot to say there is some like creepy stuff happening like um somebody will be like taking a picture for the show and then there will be this creepy presence in the background or one of the girls keeps seeing a male like figure moving in the background somewhere and it spooks them out so we're getting this like spooky element to it but it feels like bits and pieces like on goodreads it lists this as horror LGBTQ and romance and I wouldn't say it's distinctly one over the other at this point in time so I really don't know I guess it is kind of like a genre blend but it feels like I still don't know what's going on yet we're still like in the setup phase kind of despite being 70% in it is a short book though it's like 256 pages so there's that the other thing I forgot to mention because I like totally glossed over that I listened to this part was that Actually, one of the characters is now missing. The cameraman, I think, said that he had like an announcement to make to the rest of the people and he said, guys, I have something to tell you. So-and-so is missing. So now is the part where stuff is probably gonna start picking up. So I'm probably gonna figure out a little bit more about who Patricia is and what is this creepy factor going on. All right, I just finished Patricia Wants to Cuddle and it was probably not necessarily weird girl lit it was probably more along the lines of horror so the last 30 percent definitely had a lot more going on you still never explicitly find out who patricia is they never like name who patricia is but it's likely who you think it is on the cover of the book but yeah lots of horror kinds of things happen like a lot of people die at the end and one person does not die yeah i mean i liked this book i had no idea where it was going for about 70 percent of the book but i think overall it was better than my year of rest and relaxation i think i'm gonna land on 3.5 stars for this book which is not a bad rating i think it was interesting very quick easy read so that was my second book down. Now I have a couple of other books to choose from and I don't quite know where I want to go next. So I might just see which of these books has an audiobook readily available for me. I'm pretty sure Earthlings does on Hoopla but I don't know about these other three books. So I'm gonna kinda check it out and maybe see what piques my interest the most. But once I figure that out, I will let y'all know. I did a little bit more digging to see if I understood what the heck I read. So basically, you have all these like gruesome deaths and one person survives at the end. And it could potentially have this meaning of accepting who you are despite life's circumstances. So like the particular person that ends up living, there's like a... In the epilogue you cut to 40 years into the future and it talks about how that person is living their life on the island you know maybe not pretending to be who someone that they're not and if you think about all the other women who were like protecting 
Patricia. It also kind of seems like they have, because they live on this island now, one of the people you see these like letters um, back and forth between these two female characters who were in love and they were in this like Midwest town and they couldn't show that at the time in the 70s. So they had moved to this Otter Island or whatever to just be who they were. So I think it was kind of just like partly accepting who you are and also just like a horror book. <laughs> I don't really think it had too much weird girl lit vibes to it, but I mean, I, what do I know? I'm, this is kind of experimental for me too. But anyways, I am doing some sprinting right now and have put up a poll in my sprint chat for three of the books because Pizza Girl is not available currently on audio. I have to wait. Uh, I think I'm like 10th in line, so I have to wait for this one. But currently, these three are available through Hoopla, so I just requested all three. And then I put a poll up on my chat, and Earthlings was the winner. So I'm going to read Earthlings, and this one's pretty short. It's 250 pages or so, and it says, Earthlings is a spellbinding novel about childhood dreams and adulthood rebellion. Natsuki is a young girl who feels like she's been dropped into her family from an alien planet. Her best friend is a plush toy hedgehog named Piyut. Not sure how to say that, so I'm assuming this is the hedgehog. And her only human friend is her cousin Yu. Natsuki and Yu spend their summers in the wild mountains of Nagano dreaming of other worlds. When a terrible sequence of events threatens to part the children forever, they make a promise, survive no matter what. Now, Natsuki has grown, living a quiet life with her asexual husband, but dark shadows and societal pressure are pursuing her. Fleeing the suburbs for the mountains of her childhood, Natsuki prepares herself for a reunion with Yu. Will he still remember their promise, and will he help her keep it? Still have no idea what I'm getting into here, but I do hear that there are some uh, mental health themes in this one. I want to say things like unaliving, possibly depression, but make sure that you do your research and check your triggers. I don't have any triggers, so I'm going to go in very blind. But if you do have interest in reading this book, please, 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 as with any book, check your trigger warnings. All right, my dear friends, I have started Earthlings and I am in 15% in. I'm on chapter two and it is a little weird so far. <laughs> so we start out, I don't know how old they are, but they're they sound like very young. Let me see. So it says she is 11 and I think her sister is either two years above her. Yeah, her sister's 13. So she's 11 and she has a cousin and I don't know if it's her biological cousin or not, but she's like in love with her cousin. In the beginning, she is very much like I want to marry you, like I want to be your boyfriend, like let's make a pact to be together and like take care of each other. And then like the following year, they meet up again at their family, annual family trip or whatever. And she's like, oh, I've missed you so much. And now like, let's, let's actually get married. So she's like 12 and they got married. So I'm kind of like, where the heck are we going from here? Because that was definitely a way to start this book. <laughs> so that was, um interesting. So I'm going to continue listening to this, but I did get some book of the month mail. So I got my book of the month package and I actually wanted to go ahead and I wanted to open it and show you all what I got. So this is obviously a big box because I ordered a lot of books. I think I got like five books. So first and foremost, we have volume zero. I definitely need to read these because I've not read any of the other ones that I've gotten so far. The book I think I'm most excited about, holy crap, I did not realize it was kind of this thick, is Phantasma. It's so pretty, like, look at this cover. Another book I'm excited for, oh my gosh, that I didn't realize was as big either. The Crimson Crown. This is by Heather Walter, and I believe this is a Snow White retelling. It says, before the apple was poisoned, before the mirror was cursed, a witch became a queen, and a queen became a villain. Her story has been shrouded in shadow, but now she will rise. Yes, Snow White's dark queen tells her side of the story in this queer witchy reimagining of the classic fairy tale. Okay, I in fact only got four books. 
not five, but they are all kind of big. And then the last book I got is The God of the Woods, which I just found out is not mythology like I thought it was. It's actually mystery. The bookmark says, back for more. This was submitted by Chelsea C. in Lynchburg, Tennessee. I felt the need to come back and like update pretty pretty quickly on because in chapter two probably about halfway through chapter two the girl Nitsuki is trying to tell her mother that her teacher is being weird her teacher like said hey I'm trying to it's a male teacher I'm trying to correct your posture. He puts his hand on her back, but he also like touches her front side too. So she goes home and she tries to tell her mom and her mom's like, you disgusting child. A teacher, a grown male would never be interested in an underdeveloped child like you. Like you have sick, dirty thoughts. Like what is wrong with you? That like broke my heart that the, the mom's not even like listening to her child, but this mom sounds really shitty to begin with. Then um, she is out somewhere with a friend and the friend went somewhere and the teacher sees her and says, Hey, your friend is over there at my house. Like she's resting and you want to go see her? Like he's like inviting her to come over. Oh, I forgot to say after the incident where he was trying to correct her posture another day, she doesn't tell her mom about that initially, but another day her teacher says, Hey, Natsuki, I noticed that you had this like sanitary pad and you didn't like dispose of it properly. So he's like, it's part of my job to teach you that, which I don't know how true that is in Japan. Like if any teacher just teaches children this stuff. He's like teaching her how to dispose of it properly, but he says, hey, in order to like do this, you have to practice. So like go ahead and get a new one. I don't know if he like watched her, but like she was very uncomfortable with that. So then she goes home and that's when she tells her mom, like he was being kind of weird. like. Here's what he did. Mom doesn't believe her. So then um, a little while later, she's out somewhere with her friend and her friend starts not feeling well or something. And the teacher, that same teacher sees Natsuki and says, oh, your friend went to my house. Like it's right over there across the street. And she's like, oh, what's she doing there? Like, can we go visit her? You know, I want to just make sure she's okay. So they go to his house and her friend is not there because she magically felt better. That's what the teacher said. So she went on home. So he goes, oh, you know, I, you've been saying that you wanted to study and, and do well in school. So I'm going to give you a special lesson. Have you ever heard of a BJ before? What the hell is this book? <laughs> so she essentially is dissociating while he is doing this to her. And I'm sitting here like, what the hell is going on? Like, is this, is this supposed to be fiction? Is this supposed to be bringing to light this stuff? Like, I don't know what's going on. This is, you need to check your trigger warnings, that's all I'll say. Yeah, so she's essentially dis disassociating. She's literally saying, my, I, I like could see myself from the ceiling. Like, I'm looking down at myself. Yeah, that is where we're going with this story. So I just finished Earthlings, and this book felt like... A train wreck that you cannot look away from and it's not it was not a bad book it was just very different very weird a very weird interpretation or perspective on trauma arising from sexual abuse so I had mentioned before there were some very gross scenarios that happened and I think just thinking like trying to wrap my head around this I think what the main character Natsuki is dealing with. She's trying to like cope with her trauma. Um, I'm assuming that's what the whole like feeling like not from earth. She said that she feels like she's from Poppin' Po, Bo Poppin po Bapia. And um, kind of not feeling like she's from this earth. She's probably feeling like very neurodivergent, like not conforming to the factory as they call it. And the factory is kind of like mainstream society where you have like everybody just kind of doing the same thing because that's what somebody before them told them to do so it's like grow up um get married have babies procreate like do that whole thing and she's kind of like well i don't necessarily want to do that and i think some of that arises from potentially trauma 
And then I think her cousin is also dealing with some trauma. You don't get his side of things, but it is probably very likely, especially because it's probably happening within the family. And um, there is some research that talks, like, like psychological research that talks about children who experience sexual violence are more likely to demonstrate uh, sexual proclivity at a younger age. So it makes sense why, um, I don't remember if I said this, but Natsuki and her cousin Yu try to like <laughs> have sex with each other, which sounds very gross and whatever, but like they're children, they don't understand better and they've been abused and there's a lot of trauma going on. And then there's that whole layer of the parents not believing them. That was extremely infuriating and frustrating. You have another guy who enters, which is her, the main character's husband for a majority of the book. I forget what his name is. He also is likely very neurodivergent. Um, he is asexual, so he doesn't even want to have like sex or maybe even children. The family is like pounding it into them essentially that they should be procreating and if they're not going to do that then they need to get divorced and they're like no well we liked our arrangement and so all three of them kind of feel like we are from Popim Pabapia or whatever <laughs> and we don't feel like the other earthlings. Um, and then this little guy here, the little hedgehog, his name is Piute. Natsuki, that's her toy, her like little stuffed animal toy that she believes is talking to her. So again, I think there's a lot of trauma, a lot of dissociation, a lot of mental health stuff going on, ex except it's not like explicitly stated, but that is definitely the underlying theme of this. So very interesting read and very interesting perspective or take on this book. And I would say I would not recommend this for everybody, especially because of some of those very heavy topics um, so check your trigger warnings once again, but a very interesting take on this and definitely fits with the weird girl lit vibe. So <laughs> that was this one. Um, I might land, I don't know. I think I might land on four stars with this because I did enjoy it. It was very, it was like a popcorn read. I read it very quickly. Like I said, it was only about 250 ish pages, but not only was it short, but it was very captivating because of maybe all the shock factor as well as me being able to understand that psychological layer. So I might, I, I might go with four stars for this one. That's what it feels like to me. But I am gonna take a little um, step away from the Weird Girl Lit and read some other books for a moment. Um, I still do have three girl, three girls. I still do have three books that I would like to get to in this vlog, but not right right now because I have some other things I want to read. So I'm probably going to pick up one of these two next. I'm more so leaning towards this, but I am good with either. I'm still waiting on the audio for this one to come into the library. So this one might be my last one. I will catch back up with you guys in probably a couple of days when I get back into reading some more Weird Girl Lit. It is probably a couple weeks later from the last time I filmed for this vlog. I have decided that I want to go with Earth Eater next. It is only 199 pages. So this one says, in an unnamed slum in Argentina, a young woman can't stop eating earth. Her odd compulsion gives her visions of the murdered and disappeared, burdening her with secrets she'd rather not know. Earth Eater keeps her disturbing visions to herself, but soon enough, rumor of her powers spreads and desperate members of her community seek out her help to find loved ones and closure. Interesting. This sounds like it would be a good like fall time read just because it's like not witchy, but we're like connecting with the earth and there's like powers and whatnot. So I'm very excited to read this one. So let me get started with this and I will update you guys probably when I'm like halfway through it.
I did not come back and update you at 50% because I finished the book. So Earth Eaters was very interesting. I think I'm gonna land on a three stars for this one. If my synopsis of it earlier wasn't good, basically we have this girl, I don't think they ever named the main character. They just call her Earth Eater. And she is this woman who lives in the slums of Argentina and she eats dirt or the earth and has visions of missing or dead females. After eating the dirt near her, she is able to uncover very horrifying details about her mother's death and who killed her mother. And other people start hearing about her abilities and come to her looking for their loved ones, looking for answers, so they bring her dirt. And it does make her sick. It was very interesting because in the mental health field, there is actually a term for eating non-edible substances like dirt. It's called pica. So I was like, oh, I wonder if this is going to kind of bring to light this mental health diagnosis. Um, it actually, like when you read the author's note, talks a lot about femicide, which I had never heard this term before, but it's basically a broad term that talks about the killing of women or girls because of their gender. So there were these underlying themes of what it's like in Argentina and Argentina's neglect of like protecting women. It also had these underlying themes of poverty, living in the barrios of Argentina, and what that is like. So ultimately, um, this author, Dolores Reyes, she does a really good job about highlighting the brutal violence against women and the people in authority who do pretty much nothing or little to nothing to stop the violence. So this is one of those books that I would definitely recommend reading the author's note at the end because it does give you that little bit of insight. And overall, I did enjoy this book. It was it was very short, very quick read. I think the audio was like three or four hours on double speed. I will say there were some things that got kind of lost in translation with this one because it was originally published in Spanish. Like the the flow of the writing itself felt kind of choppy at times and it was really hard to know especially when just like pretty much listening to the audio it was hard to know when a new section was starting maybe because i had it on so fast but it doesn't like say oh chapter whatever it's just kind of like where one section ends you literally turn the page and you just go on to another so maybe having if i had been reading along visually i would have gotten a different experience but at times it did feel kind of choppy and i couldn't figure out where the beginning and the end point was for a specific you know chapter or section that the author was writing about and because i was listening to the audiobook i will say that i do have some notes on that the narrator wasn't as engaging she kind of had this very like flat tone of voice throughout and it was hard to stay engaged and I think they probably narrated it that way because the book is meant to have a more somber tone to it so I get it. Yeah overall decent book three stars I enjoyed myself. So I have started Pizza Girl. I started Pizza Girl this morning and I'm gonna read the synopsis on the back of the book and tell you kind of like where I'm at so far. So it says, 18 years old, pregnant, and working as a pizza delivery girl in suburban Los Angeles, our charmingly dysfunctional heroine is deeply lost. She's grieving the death of her father, with whom she has more in common than she'd like to admit, avoiding her supportive mom and loving boyfriend and flagrantly ignoring her future. Her world is further upended when she becomes obsessed with Jenny, a stay-at-home mother new to the neighborhood, who comes to depend on weekly deliveries of pickle-covered pizzas for her son's happiness. As one woman looks toward motherhood and the other toward middle age, the relationship between the two begins to blur in strange, complicated, and ultimately heartbreaking ways. Bold, tender, propulsive, and wholly unpredictable, Jean Kyung Fraser's Pizza Girl is a moving and funny portrait of a flawed, unforgettable young woman as she tries to find her place in the world. So far, I'm about 40 pages in, and it is a shorter book, so I'm getting through it pretty quickly. What I know so far about this book is that our main 
female character that is unnamed is a pizza delivery girl and one day she gets a call from Jenny who has just moved into town from I think North Dakota. Um, the town that they're in currently is Los Angeles and Jenny says hey I've called like six different pizza joints and I've asked for pickles on a pizza and nobody has been able to deliver because they don't serve pickles as a topping. Can you please help me? Like it's the only thing that will make my son happy and the only thing that he will eat right now. So our main character does this and she shows up at Jenny's house and it's kind of a weird interaction. Jenny discovers that the main character is pregnant and says some like real interesting things to her like you know how are you feeling like are you happy and the main character says like no and Jenny's like well good keep that feeling right because everybody likes to tell you how you should feel when you're pregnant like you should feel like happy and amazing and like you're glowing and all this stuff and she's probably not happy because she's also 18 and she's working this like pizza delivery job that probably doesn't make a lot of money and has other hopes and dreams for her life but can't do them now that she's having a baby at 18. Then our main character ends up leaving Jenny's house and then um, the next day I think she receives a call I think it's the next day that she receives a call from Jenny that she wants another pizza with pickles on it. The main character finds herself thinking about Jenny a little bit more and this is I think is where it's gonna start getting kind of weird like this obsession I think on the back it even says so I am gonna continue on reading a little bit more tonight to see what happens with this budding relationship okay I was listening to my book last night in bed and I obviously was not gonna film but I wanted to touch base with you guys this morning and read this like one paragraph that was very weird. It just came out of nowhere. One morning I sat on the toilet and sobbed to a Powerade commercial. Billy and mom had both gone off to work and I was alone in the house sitting on the toilet unable to shit. I wasn't experiencing morning sickness or swelling in my ankles. I wasn't needing to piss every time I took a sip of water but I was lucky if I could shit even once a day. Shitting was one of my simplest life pleasures. Before I was pregnant, each of my mornings would start off with me stumbling to the bathroom, plopping on the toilet with the lights off, and having one quick shit before my eyes were even fully open. I was just like more taken by surprise that this popped up in the book. So it was just so random. Like, never did I think that I would be reading about shitting in my books. So there you go me reading about poop freak right there but yeah this so far i've read a little bit more since last night and this girl i'm gonna call her pizza girl because that's what she is because she doesn't have a name they haven't named her yet pizza girl is definitely like grieving the loss of her father who sounds like he battled with alcoholism and she's kind of growing this obsession with jenny the girl who keeps ordering pizza and now we're at this scene where Jenny hasn't ordered pizza and she routinely orders pizza like every Wednesday or something. And Jenny hasn't ordered her weekly pizza so Pizza Girl gets very concerned and worried and she decides, okay, I'm gonna go over to her house and like see what's up. So she waits there for a minute and then eventually the car pulls up and Jenny gets out, Pizza Girl gets out, meets her and just asks if she's okay and she's like, yeah, um, do you mind doing me a favor? Can you watch Adam? Adam is Jenny's son. She's like, can you watch Adam for me? And she just, like, goes away. She doesn't say where she goes. She just goes away. So all the while, Pizza Girl is, like, babysitting Adam. And, um, I don't know, a couple hours later, Jenny gets back. And she's like, oh, you must think I'm, like, the worst mom. And I'm thinking, like, what the hell? Like, she just, like, left her kid with technically a stranger. And... Uh, she's like, don't you want to ask me where I went? And Pizza Girl goes, well, where'd you go? Jenny goes, I went to the movies. <laughs> okay. All right. She just needed a, a minute, but very random way to do that. There was something that just came up that I thought was really sweet when Pizza Girl and Adam were hanging out. They were just like sitting, watching TV or something. And one of the commercials comes on for something and there's a somebody named Joe 
It's like a commercial with like these fish in it. Adam goes, oh, I remember one of the fish's names. It was a blue fish with a long face and a frowny mouth. She goes, what was its name? Joe, why Joe? There's a boy named Joe in my class who always flicks pencils at my back. Sometimes he spits in my pudding at lunch. This fish reminded you of him? And he goes, no, I just wanted to have a Joe that I liked. That's so like, so sad. Like so sad and so like sweet, you know, just for a kid to, to just have, you know, who doesn't want to be bullied. It's, ah. Oh. But yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. I think I've got like, 70-ish more pages left of this book and it's, it's interesting. It's definitely weird. <laughs> Not like super duper weird, but it's like, yeah, just, it's just an interesting read. Just a different, different take than what I've been reading lately. So I'm going to go to work and I'm going to hopefully finish this book at some point today and I'll come back with my thoughts on this book before I start my last book for this vlog. So it's later in the day and I have just finished Pizza Girl. I think the last update I had given you guys was that she's basically just kind of grieving the loss of her father. Um, as the book progresses, you start seeing that Pizza Girl has some of the same characteristics as her father in terms of drinking. Um, and so, yes, yeah, she is pregnant and she's drinking. She's drinking a lot and kind of like living with Billy, or Billy actually lives with her and her mom, but Billy and her share a room together but Billy has mentioned like what's going on like I feel like we live together but I don't ever see you and so he's kind of expressing his sadness he feels like he's losing connection with pizza girl and um he you know really loves her he he wants a better life for her him their baby on the way you know he's willing to try to fix it and you know just make things better but he's kind of struck with the realization that she might not love him and um he has a gun at one point i don't know what he was planning to do with the gun but eventually it ends up in like pizza girl's possession somehow and one day she decides to go visit jenny who has moved away brings this gun unbeknownst to her the gun's actually empty so she's not like a real threat but she is not going to harm Jenny at all. She just has the gun to make sure that if, you know, she tells Jenny, hey, we're going to run, we're going to take Adam, that the husband is not going to give them any shit, basically. Pizza Girl shows up to Jenny's house and is actually drunk. So yes, yeah, she is pregnant and she's drunk, has this gun, ends up like watch. she finds Adam, the son, and is like brushing his hair, like... Oh, like sweet Adam, you know, making sure he's safe. Goes to find where Jenny is. She eventually sees Jenny with her husband. You know, they're canoodling, they're doing their thing. And she really, it dawns upon her that Jenny loves her husband. She didn't move away because she was forced to. She moved away because she wanted to be closer to her husband. She wanted to, you know, really support him and see him. And I think he like worked out of like, a couple hours away or whatever so pizza girl ends up passing out in their house drunk the um mom and the and billy they get a phone call from jenny saying your girl's here drunk like <laughs> and the husband is freaking out because he's like a pregnant girl in my house with a gun drunk like Never seen her before. Pizza Girl wakes up in the hospital the next day. Not, like, she's trying to come to. Eventually, you find out that Pizza Girl gets fired from her job because, she, not because of the incident, but because she just didn't show up for a shift and wasn't answering her phone. Her phone was actually broken. So, the story goes on where eventually Pizza Girl finds a job bagging groceries and, um... Billy goes off to community college, taking night classes because he wants to get a better job to support his 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 growing family. And um, one day, Jenny shows up at the grocery store, and they have this little conversation. Pizza Girl's kind of like, "Why are you here? Like, you don't even know my real name, so like, why are you here?" 
She's like, what are you talking about? I do know your name. It's Jane. And she tells Jane that she's also pregnant. Pizza Girl goes, well, it'd be kind of funny if I named my baby Jenny. And Jenny also says the same. Like, it'd be funny if I named my child Jane. And they kind of like laugh at that. And eventually Jane, aka Pizza Girl, gets a phone call from Billy. And he's like, hey, can you pick up some groceries for me? And she's like, no, I've already left. But, like, hey, how about we go to this nice, like, restaurant? Me, you, and my mom. And it's, like, really, you see it as her first step into um, trying to reconnect with Billy. And then she also goes through the next couple weeks still drinking, but she's trying to reduce her drinking and eventually stops. So... I think it was a very interesting story. It had a lot of, I think a lot of the books in this vlog are like this, but it had a, a lot of underlying, you know, themes of mental health where there's definitely some infidelity going on, um, losing connection, possibly depression, possibly contemplating suicide, alcoholism, just general dissatisfaction with life, uncertainty, coming of age. There's just, I don't know, I, I felt like the story was really good. Like it wasn't really about anything. Like you, it was more, I feel like character driven, like versus plot driven. And I actually really enjoyed myself. I thought the writing was really good. So I think I'm going to give this a four star. And I hope that you pick it up too if you're into this kind of weird girl vibe. And the art on the cover is super cute. But yeah, definitely would read more by this author. Now, the last book of the vlog is The Virgin Suicides. So I'm going to read you the synopsis on the back of this. It is a modern classic, um, but it says, In a quiet suburb of Detroit, the five Lisbon sisters, beautiful, eccentric, and obsessively watched by the neighborhood boys, commit suicide one by one over the course of a single year. As the boys observe them from afar, transfixed, they piece together the mystery of the family's fatal melancholy in this hypnotic and unforgettable novel of adolescent love, disquiet, and death. Jeffrey Eugenides evokes the emotions of youth with haunting sensitivity and dark humor and creates a coming-of-age story unlike any of our time. It was adapted into a film. It's a modern masterwork, a lyrical and timeless tale of sex and suicide that transforms and mythologizes suburban middle American life. So I have a feeling this is going to be another more character-driven book versus plot-driven, but I'm very excited to be starting this one. So here we go, getting into it. This is the book that will never end. I have 40 more pages left and I don't care about this book anymore. I feel like I don't know what I'm reading about and it's not that it's too high level for me. I get everything that it's saying. I just feel like what's the point? It's boring. It's not giving me any new information. I don't feel like I'm learning anything or gaining anything from this. It literally is just, hey, here's these girls that died by suicide, all five sisters, like, within one year, which that alone, it's bonkers. Like, that's that's a lot for one family. And I get that it's about, they wanted to escape from their, like, entrapped life. They're, they're feeling like their parents had all this control over them and them... Dying by suicide was like their way of taking control back. And then you're getting the story from the boys' perspective. I'm assuming the boys like in the neighborhood or their school. And kind of like the lasting impact that it's had on them. But there's also a lot to this story that's like, who cares? Like, And I say that not in a mean way. Not anything related to suicide. But it's like, why are we talking about some of the most random things? I don't know. This just isn't a book for me. I really want to like it. But I just, I don't really care. I have like 40 pages left and I'm just going to tough it out, finish it. But like I said, I just, I'm not invested in this book. And it's kind of sad that the vlog is going to end with this book. <laughs> so, 
I'll be back with my final thoughts and some wrap up stuff in a moment for you. I have finally finished The Virgin Suicides and I've decided to rate this two and a half stars. Not because it's bad writing. I think I was just incredibly bored. And I had mentioned in my last clip that I understand the underlying themes, the whole, like, what's going on in the book. That doesn't take away from the fact that this book was so boring. It kind of felt like a sad slice of life. And, I mean, I guess that's what it was. But I'm very happy that this book is over. <laughs> and I'm very sad that this was the last book of this vlog. Um, so I'll give you kind of a little recap. I read six books total. Um, I started out the vlog with my year of rest and relaxation. And this one I rated three stars. Now that I'm like thinking about it, kind of feel like it definitely was better than The Virgin Suicides, but it was still kind of like one of those plotless book so you're kind of like what's the point of this so wasn't my favorite i think i read patricia wants to cuddle next if not it was the third book that i read but i gave that one three and a half stars that one definitely had a lot more plot to it it was kind of like mysterious very interesting it kept me intrigued enough to like want to finish and figure out who the heck patricia was after that i picked up earthlings which might have been my favorite book in this vlog. I rated this one four stars. This one does have some triggers, so you definitely want to check those out before you decide to read this one. But overall, I really liked the way that the author wrote about those things, and the story was just kind of like fascinating to me. Very weird, but very fascinating. Um, the next book I read was Earth Eater. I gave this one three stars. I really liked the story like the premise of this but this one also had some kind of like heavier topics darker themes um so you want to kind of check those trigger warnings but this was probably my second favorite maybe maybe tied with pizza girl pizza girl might be a little bit above that because i gave pizza girl a four star this one just kind of was very weird but I liked the plot of it, kind of just like the storyline, the writing, I thought was really good. It just had a lot of elements for a literary fiction that I would want to pick up and read. So out of the books that I own, this would probably be my order from favorite to least favorite. Patricia Wants to Cuddle is probably after Pizza Girl, so somewhere right in the middle. Overall, these weren't like my favorite books ever. But I definitely would say that I do like some elements of Weird Girl Lit. Probably the more weirder ones are more interesting to me. Um, the ones that are kind of like plotless, that just like you're kind of wondering what is the point of this book? Why am I even reading this? It's got no storyline. Probably things that I'm not as interested in. But the ones that are that have story to them, that have maybe a deeper underlying theme to them, like you kind of have to take more of a critical lens on them, more analytical lens on them. I think I like those more. So like just kind of thinking about some of the elements of this one and Patricia Wants to Cuddle, they had these um, underlying themes of like this one being um, feeling isolated, feeling different, like you're not from this planet, probably has to do with like more mental health stuff, some neurodivergence, some depression going on. Patricia Wants to Cuddle is more looking at companionship among women as well as forbidden love in the 70s and how that has kind of transformed over time and has created this community of women that come together to protect Patricia who only wants to be loved. And then even thinking like Pizza Girl was Pizza Girl Earth Eater, these are both very weird in their own ways. Like this one, the girl's eating dirt. This one, Pizza Girl gets obsessed with a stay-at-home mom who orders pizza with pickles. So like, I don't know. But when you take a look at books like Year of Rest and Relaxation and The Virgin Suicides, it's kind of like, what was the point of these? Why, why do I want to read these? And I feel like they're such staples in weird girl literature that I'm kind of like, why like why do people read this boring stuff clearly there's some reason but like i don't know i am curious to hear your thoughts on like where you fall in weird girl 
literature, like let me know. Also, if you've gotten to the end of this video, I would greatly appreciate if you could like recommend other kinds of weird books. I do have a couple more that I own that I probably would do another video at some point in the future. But I think I'm going to take a step away from weird literature for now and focus a little bit more on some fantasy reads coming up in the near future. So stay tuned for that. But thanks for clicking on today's video. Don't forget to like the video. And if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And I will catch you guys in the next one. Bye.